Hi, everybody. Tim Coble with Gumshoe Stories here, and it is the seventh anniversary of um, the sad passing of Missy Beavers. Her murder um, occurred seven years ago today uh, in the early morning hours in Midlothian, Texas. Um, and, you know, it's been a while since I put any content out here and just uh, not a whole lot to report, but I just don't feel like we can let the seven year anniversary of Missy Beaver's passing go by without acknowledging it, remembering it, um, and recommitting ourselves to, you know, to trying to solve this murder or at least keep, keep it alive and keep it out there in the public space so that tips can continue to flow in so that ultimately police can solve it. And so that's, that's my goal. And, um, for those of you that have followed the case, I'm sure that's that's your goal, too. So um, just uh, we really kind of have just an open ended kind of thing going here. Um, I don't have much of an agenda and, you know, no fancy graphics or anything. I just thought that we would uh, talk about it, just uh, talk about the case. And so um, I'm I'm interested in in hearing from you guys. Um, join us in the live chat and let's talk about it. I'll be glad to answer any questions that you guys might have. I haven't figured out here on the computer how to how to get to the chat, so I'm going to look at that part on the phone. Um, hello, Sharon. Hello, Raymond. Hello, Chris. Um, yeah, uh, Sharon says she saw an article in the in the Dallas Morning News that there is nothing to report and that that's disappointing. Yeah, it, it is <clears throat> disappointing. Um, there just there just isn't a lot going on. And uh, you have to believe, well, you don't have to believe, but if you're me, um, then, then what I believe is that um, <clears throat> we're just kind of at a point where uh, the tips have dried up. And, uh, you know, I, I think that this person who, who committed this murder, this killer, is either dead themselves or they're excellent at keeping a secret and they've spoken to no one about what happened. Um, and <clears throat> that, that's what I think. I think that they, they've spoken to no one about what happened. And, you know, it's possible that this person has no connection to Missy Beavers. If there's no connection to Missy Beavers, then that makes solving the case even more difficult. Um, and let's face it, police have only had two people in seven years that even rise close to the level of person of interest, uh, much less suspect. One of them, which pretty much everyone knows about, is uh, uh, Bobby Wayne Henry. Um, and from the get-go, you knew he wasn't the person in the church because he's six one, and the killer is short, like five five, five six, something like that. So, uh, so Bobby Wayne Henry, they followed tips on him to do their due diligence, but I, I don't know that they ever really thought that that he was the guy. And there's only been one other person since, as far as getting to the point where they could actually execute search warrants, and it was a female person of interest. I'm not going to name because I don't believe that person had anything to do with it. I named Bobby Wayne Henry simply because his name's been way out there in, in the public, um, you know, since 2018 or so, 2017 maybe. So, um, you know, and, and this, this female that they did some search warrants on, uh, she was, you know, she was looked at and this was in 2020. This was three years ago. So in three years, if if they haven't been able to do much more with uh, with her as a suspect, then you have to believe that that's probably as much of a dead end as Bobby Wayne Henry. Um, I could be wrong about that, but I, I don't think that I am. And then where does that leave us? Um, if they don't have a suspect or even a person of interest, if they've had seven years to look at everybody with any connection to Missy Beavers and they've come up dry, where does that leave us? 
Um, those of you who followed me for a while, you know that I really lean toward the burglary angle, uh, wrong place, wrong time. Um, there's a lot of things that for me point in that direction. Um, and I'd be happy to talk about any of those. Um, also happy to talk about the targeted theory. If, if you want to talk about that and, and tell us why you think that Missy was targeted and what you've seen as far as evidence and surveillance video or whatever that makes you think that, then let's discuss it. Um, uh, Chris Champion says uh, he's curious to see Aaron Stoner's final verdict video when it comes out. Yeah, I know that's something that uh, that Aaron Stoner has teased since before the beginning of the year. Um, he, he could produce some slick looking graphics on video. Um, but I think that ultimately he kind of goes off on a tangent um, in terms of things that he thinks that he sees after after filtering these videos and still images and staring at them on a big screen. It's like he sees something there that I don't believe is there, such as a prosthetic foot or limb. Um, hey, Black Box Online Radio is here. Um, thanks uh, for, for joining us. Appreciate you being here. Um, Black Box Online Radio guys did a um, did a podcast on the Missy Beavers case several years ago, and so um, feel free to check that out if you've never gone back and 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 checked out uh, what they've done on on the Missy Beavers case. Then that's well worth listening to. <clears throat> Anybody got any any questions um, as we as we get into this and? and start talking about Missy. Again, it's been seven years ago today. Um, she was dead um, from, from what we're told around 4.20 a.m. Uh, seven years ago today. Um, okay, let's look at this question. Cole says, years ago I saw a chat on the father-in-law in reference to his business and something illegal going on. I know he wasn't around at the time, but I could never find that information again. Um, yeah, Cole, that that information, as far as I know, has been internet rumor uh, and never substantiated. Um, I, I've never bothered to try to substantiate it for the simple reason that, you know, Randy Beavers was half a country away. Um, I think with him, just like anybody else close in to Missy Beavers in the family um, or friends or coworkers, I think that those people were vetted and looked at as closely as they could be. And um, if there was something there, I think surely police would have found something um, and they found nothing. Um, Black Box Online Radio asks what points toward a burglary as opposed to a specific hit. OK, well, let me let me give a few things. Um, number one, what strikes me about the video of the person who is walking around in the church is that that person never stops at the entrance exit that Missy would come in later. Um, this is where that camera is when the person is maybe prying on that door for a little bit and then gives up and, and walks on to the split door room. That camera is right above that entrance. And that person never stops, never looks outside, never shows any interest in someone who is due to arrive. That, that's really compelling to me. That, that's not behavior that you expect to see of someone who's looking to murder somebody. But it, it's like a lot of people think backwards from the targeted theory. They start and they have targeted in their mind. And then they look at the movements of the killer on the video and in their mind, they just want to try to make it fit. But if you, if you take that out of it, if you had never known about Missy Beavers, you didn't know uh, that a murder had happened or anything. And I showed you a video for the first time of someone walking around in a church. I think that you probably would not think that that person is there to commit a murder. You would think this is a person who is interested in something in that building. 
which is why they're going from room to room. They're looking for something specific. And when they look in a room, they don't see it. They immediately come out and they go to the next room. That So that is a compelling reason for me that I think that it may be a burglary as opposed to targeted. Because when you talk about lying in wait for someone, wouldn't you stay around where that entrance is waiting on that person to arrive? And we know that at the point that person is walking in front of that entrance and then going on to the other side of the church, it's almost 4 a.m. And we have in a police dispatch report, a lot of you probably haven't seen it, but I have, and it's open public record. It says uh, police interviewed one of the campers who told them, and they put it in this report, the officer put in the report that a camper said that Missy normally arrived at 4 a.m. So if this person has targeted Missy, you can assume this person has looked into her schedule. They know that she goes to that church early in the morning. You figure they know when she usually arrives. If she usually arrives at four, why do they show no interest in staying around that entrance and looking for her? Why do they take themselves out of strategic position? That's a big question that I have that I can't answer if, if I'm believing the targeted theory. Um, and when you combine with the fact that there was a suspicious vehicle down the road at SWFA uh, not long before that, um, that's compelling as well. Here you've got a car driving very slowly, turning its headlights on and off around the whole perimeter of a commercial building at 2 a.m. in the morning. And people with the targeted theory don't seem to think that this person is interested in the building. They think the person is just killing time or whatever, which is what a lot of targeted people think about the killer inside the church. They think the killer inside the church isn't interested in the building. They're killing time waiting on Missy. Well, who kills time to wait to kill somebody that is coming in a door at any moment? Why do we look at a, a car going around SWFA slowly and say, well, he's not interested in the building when everything about that video seems to indicate he is interested in the building. And then why do we look at the surveillance video in the church of a person going room to room to room, walking around the entire interior of a, of a building? And why, why do we say, oh, he's not interested in what it looks like he's interested in. He's really just waiting for Missy. It, it's like we don't want to consider it. We don't want to consider that it may be as simple as the person in the car is staking out SWFA, thinking about hitting that building for a burglary either that night or at some point in the future. And then they go on to the church and they go around the interior of the church because they've decided maybe this is an easier mark. So that to me is is very is very compelling. Let, let's look at some of the other things that we that we see here. If it was a hit, why wouldn't the killer kill her in the parking lot? Yeah, that, that that's a good question. How, how would the killer have even known that Missy was going to walk into that building? Because she was killed, and a lot of people don't know this. She was killed down at the far end from where she came in, and. The video that we haven't seen, but which uh, Dr. Michael Nirenberg, a forensic podiatrist who was sent some of that unreleased video by police, he said that he she appears to hear something or see something, um, and then she walks down the hallway until the camera cuts off. So she goes all the way down, and, and it's about 170, 180 feet from one end entrance down to the far end to the other entrance. And that's where she was murdered. Um, that, that person, if they were waiting for Missy, they would have no assurance that she was going to come inside and then come all the way down to where they killed her. Um, she could have gotten halfway and then turned around and ran and been spooked and gotten her truck and driven away or called 911. 
a, a person who's trying to kill somebody doesn't take a chance like that, in, in my opinion. And, and another thing is uh, that mystery object. A lot of people don't know what it is. I actually know what it is. The person is is carrying um, a little storage bin, a little plastic storage bin that you can buy at Walmart or Target. And it has some little tools in it, like sockets. He picked it up in room 10. And we see in that video, he comes out of room 10 carrying that object. And then he hammers out the glass of the door that's across from room 10, which is a storage room, room nine. Why would someone wanting to kill Missy be even interested in picking up a plastic bin full of sockets? I, I can't imagine why. And he didn't hold on to them for long because later on he comes around to the auditorium and he no longer has that in his hand. And, and I know from my sources that, um, that that plastic bin was left at the church. Uh, police were able to look at it and test it. Uh, Kevin Johnson even referred um, to to that non-specifically when he said that there were some tools that uh, that they found that they were analyzing. But um, why would he even bother with that? I mean, is he going to hit her with sockets to knock her out? I, I don't think so. Um, and so those are those are questions that I have. Let's look at uh, at some of our other questions here. Um, Okay, well, we have a few people talking about someone waiting outside. And you can't eliminate that as a possibility. Um, police, though, in the warrants don't, they clearly don't think that there's any other people there, particularly inside the church. And every single exterior camera was not malfunctioning. Okay, there was a camera under the, awning um, that captured campers uh, waiting outside the door prior to 5 a.m. It was mentioned in a in a January 2019 search warrant. Um, and so if if there had been an accessory and they had been over there, they would have they would have been seen on video. Um, we can't rule it out. However, it's kind of a logical problem that in order to make a theory fit, you've got to invent a second person. It, it's kind of like the grassy knoll in the Kennedy assassinate, assassination. Um, no real evidence, but it, if, if you put a person on the grassy knoll, then it can make your conspiracy theory uh, have some validity to it. So again, a second person in the Missy Beavers murder can answer some problems with the targeted theory, but we don't have a shred of evidence that shows that there was a second person. We're just having to serve our theory by creating that. And so that's that's a problem. Um, you know, Jackie Johnson says the same thing. It was a, a, a planned murder with two people present at the church, one inside and one out. Again, we can't totally rule that out, but we don't have anything to indicate a second person. Hey there, Shiva's girl. Good to see you. Okay, Jackie, you said uh, they wrote in one article about a vehicle on video. Whatever video it was, I think it was a video by the church. Nope, actually, I, the, uh, the article, I, I know the reference you're making, and that reference was before they released the SWFA still image, which they released uh, in June of 2016. In May of 2016, they referred to a vehicle that you could kind of see in a corner, but couldn't really make out much. That's what the police were talking about. They were talking about the vehicle at SWFA. Um, Sharon says she agrees that um, that Missy was was not targeted. We're in the minority, Sharon, but that's okay. I mean, everybody's got an opinion and we need to respect all opinions. But what, what I really like to do is explore why we believe what we believe. Um, looking at the evidence, looking at um, our biases, you know, it, it's really hard for anybody not to have some bias. Uh, let me give you an example. You look at the person in the church wearing police gear. And I have seen so many people comment, why would anybody go to all that trouble 
to dress up in SWAT gear to go burglarize a church. Well, it took me several years before something really dawned on me and got me past the bias. You know, it, it's a compelling thing to look at that video and to think that that person in that SWAT gear chose to dress that way for the church, but we don't know that, okay? We don't know the person's previous uh, activities that night. We don't know what they were thinking at 9 o'clock or what they were doing at 11 p.m. or midnight or 1 a.m. We only see video of them dressed that way in that church. But what if they dress that way for SWFA? Do you know SWFA has like 150 high-res cameras? And those cameras pan and zoom, and they are extremely top of the line. If I was thinking about my target being SWFA, I would dress to the nines. I would dress head to toe in something that would not show anything, um, even just to drive around or possibly to break in. You know, maybe this person was thinking about breaking in SWFA. There were some vehicles that were parked on the back end. Maybe they got spooked. That's when they, that's when they stopped turning their headlights on and they went on around uh, and parked in front of, of the building. Um, so, you know, to me, if we take out our bias that this person dressed this way specifically for the church, because we don't know that, then we could see someone dressing for SWFA, and then they decide they don't want to do that, and they look for something else as a target of convenience. Could be last minute. Maybe they noticed it. They had to pass the church on the way to get to SWFA. It was on the other side of the highway, but they had to pass it. And maybe they made a decision then that it was plan B. Um, don't know. Also possible that someone wanted to commit a burglary that night and they didn't even have a target in mind. They just knew they were going to go up Highway 287. And so they dress in this gear because it's available to them somehow. Um, and they're sort of dressing that way for worst case scenarios so that they are covered from head to toe. That's a possibility too. Um, so those are just some of the things that, that I've thought about. Um, all right, let's look at some of these others. Black Box on Light Radio. And I'm sorry if I'm uh, missing some questions. I'll try to stop talking for a little bit and just look at some of these. Different type of question. Does the killer have a prosthetic leg? I vote no. Yeah, um, Aaron Stoner produced that theory. I don't believe it. The family doesn't believe it. Um, I don't think there's a prosthetic. I think that there are artifacts and reflections that are introduced when you look at a video frame by frame. You have to be really careful when you look at something frame by frame because a second of video can have 30 or 60 or more frames in it. So if you see something in one frame, you ought to see that thing in some of the frames after it and some of the frames before it. But people will see a shadow. Um, they do this a lot with the SWFA car uh, with some of the reflections and shadows and the rain and everything where they think they see things inside the vehicle. But you'd have to be able to see it for longer than a couple of frames because that's just a fraction of a second. Um, let's see. Rob S. says, I think it was a random, illogical, irrational, meaningless crime with no connection to Missy. That's why it's hard to solve. There would be some link somewhere if it was someone who wanted her dead. Yep, that's that's one of one of the things that that I think as I as I think through this. Positively, Parker. Hey, good to have you here. Um, if this is the Parker I'm thinking about, I've been a guest on on your podcast in the past. Is it true that they are very interested in a certain female being a suspect? Yes and no. They were very interested. They had tips that they followed up on in 2020. Um, I have the search warrants. I've known about this person um, for several years. Um, you know, they did ballistics tests on guns um, that this person owned. 
and they they looked into a lot of things um but there's just a lot of uh kind of facebook group nonsense uh around that person and some of the people around her um pointing a finger because they don't like her because she acts weird or whatever um kind of like april sandoval if you remember the very beginning of the case there was uh, the Dallas Observer um, wrote an article um, about unwanted internet sleuths uh, that this was about at the two year mark. And it, it talked about April Sandoval, who was someone that certain uh, internet people came up with and uh, harassed and stalked and told police about her. And that was a dead end. And I think this other person has turned out to be a dead end too, because three years later, if there's anything to find, and I can tell you this person is not a rocket scientist, okay? I'm not going to name her. I think she's innocent. Uh, police have not named her, um, but she I don't think she could pull off something like this and keep it secret for seven years. All right. And so that's, that's what I think about that, Positively Parker. Um, yeah, she's, it is true that police looked into that person, but they have to look into tips that come in, and tips did come in about her. And um, she was interviewed early in the case, and then a retired federal agent who was brought in as a consultant to look back through the case file, there were some things that she said in her interview that kind of jumped out at him, and so he, he encouraged MPD to take another look. And so they did, and they did some digging, and, and they found some, some things that were worthy of them looking uh, more into it. But again, um, three years later, no other warrants since October of 2020 for this person. No arrests. What would be this female's motive, she, this girl, says. And, and that's another thing. Uh, the motive was really convoluted. The motive was not romance, not cheating, but um, you're stealing my best friend um, is is my only way to to uh, describe it. Um, a, a woman killing another woman because that woman is in her mind stealing her best friend away from her. You know, and and these people are in their forties. Um, I don't think so. Uh, that is, that's just really out there as a theory. Um, most people kill for money and they kill for love. They don't kill because a friendship is going away. You know, it's just bizarre to me. All right, let's see what else we've got. Do you think Marsha Tucker's letters were a little weird? Um, good question, Cole. Uh, and that was that was really early in the case. I think a lot of people have sort of forgotten about those. Um, the bottom line is the family kind of, or some of people in the family anyway, thought that a certain person was the killer. And they admitted later that they were wrong. Um, in those early weeks, you know, you, you get sure about something. You think this murder is going to be solved in no time. Uh, people tell you things, you hear things, uh, and, and, and you can get swayed. I think Marsha was swayed um, that, that a particular person was the killer, and, um, and then that did not pan out. So, but, you know, I think Marsha was very well-meaning. I mean, if you go back and you read what she said, um, she was she was imploring and pleading, um, trying to get through to somebody that she thought maybe she could get through to, to turn themselves in. So um, I, I have no problem with her, with her doing that. Okay, Sharon says that the Dallas Morning News article today says MPD is holding back evidence um, as they do. Any guesses as to what they may have? Well, um, I do have one guess, and, and it's 
kind of something that has come out before very briefly in one article. They have DNA. And the only time that DNA was ever mentioned was in one article where Kevin Johnson was interviewed by it was either the Midlothian Mirror or the uh, Waxahachie Daily Light, um, but it was a local paper. And um, he basically said that they were interested in trying to do facial compositing. Um, and that's a DNA technique where you actually try to create a, a model uh, of a face where the eyes are a certain color based upon what the DNA shows. Uh, the hair might be a certain color, the skin tone. Um, it has been used in some murder cases to some degree of success, I think. Um, they said that they sent a sample to, um, to a lab that sort of specializes in, in facial compositing, but that it was not um, a good enough sample uh, for them to be able to work with. But here's what's interesting about that to me. When they said that the, the sample was not useful for the facial compositing, they never said that it was not useful at all. What they said, and uh, here's D.R. Tuttle, to say that it was a mixed partial sample that they couldn't use for facial compositing. They never said that it was not useful at all. So... I wonder if they got enough from that to be able to determine what the gender was or something else. Um, or maybe they're able to rule people out. Maybe they haven't been able to find a match and rule somebody in, but maybe they have enough of a DNA sequence there, but enough markers that if there's a suspect that comes along and they can get a sample of that suspects DNA, they can compare it to what they already have and see. So, and that's just a guess on my part that they, that they have enough that they can do that. I hope so. I hope that they didn't use up that entire sample in sending it to, uh, to the facial compositing lab. I also hope that they're not just blowing smoke. Sometimes police, as a tactic, will lie to the public. They absolutely will do that. And if they didn't have DNA, but they put something out just in the local paper to say that they did have DNA, then somebody they're watching as, as a person of interest, they're looking to see how that person might react to that news and whether they panic. I'm not saying they did that in this case, but I can't rule it out that they made up the fact that they had DNA. But a mixed partial sample, when you think about it, a rape kit is a mixed partial sample, and they're able to use rape kits to, to determine, um, you know, a, a, a perpetrator of, of a sexual assault. And so, so they can use mixed and partial DNA, but the thing that's always struck me about that is, uh, you know, what, how did they come up with the DNA? How did they collect this DNA? Is it blood evidence? Is it other bodily fluids? Is it touch DNA? And how do they know that it is Missy's mixed with the killer and not Missy mixed with somebody else? That church had 300 people in it the day before. So I just wonder what it is about the crime scene that might give police um, an assurance that this is probably the killer's DNA mixed with Missy's as opposed to some other person. So I don't know. What else we've got? Shiva's girl says they murdered Missy, so there could have been DNA left on the body or at the scene, or as Tim says, it could be a ruse. And and yeah, if they collected DNA from her body, that that could be something that maybe doesn't totally eliminate it being someone unrelated to the murder. But at the same time, it, it makes the odds pretty good that it might be someone related to the murder. looking to see if I if I missed any other questions so far. I 
once again, just glad that everybody has joined us today. And um, it feels good, even though we don't have any answers, it just feels good for people who care about this case to get together, to just be in the same room, even if it's a virtual room, and, uh, and be able to talk to one another and remember Missy. Um, here's another thing that I'll say um, that kind of disappoints me. Um, and you guys, I mean, I mean, I, I don't want to hammer anybody in the head with the untargeted theory. I do more and more strongly believe that it probably was untargeted. But what I find is that mostly out there in the public space and in media, it's not talked about enough as a possibility. And I think that the problem with that is that when tips do come in to police, tips are influenced by what's out there and what people read and hear. And if all that they're hearing and reading is that it was targeted, then what about that person out there who's a girlfriend of a guy who was a petty thief at one point and uh, when he got really drunk one night, he, he said that he murdered somebody in a church while he was burglarizing it. And, and what if that girlfriend, and this is just hypothetical, but what if that girlfriend doesn't even connect it to Missy Beavers? Because all she's ever heard about is that it's targeted, that somebody knew Missy, that they were waiting for her and they killed her and that it had nothing to do with a burglary. Um, then that person maybe never calls Crime Stoppers. And so as a result, maybe police never get that tip. And by the way, since I mentioned Crime Stoppers, here's the phone number for Ellis County Crime Stoppers. Um, if you are local to the area, if you think you have a really good tip about the Missy Beavers case. Um, something actionable. You know, they they said early on, don't call us about the way somebody walks, that you think it, that it's similar, you know, anything about the gait or the body posture. If it's something really more actionable, like, well, I know a guy that lived in Midlothian and, you know, he he did this behavior the on April 19th, uh, the day after, and he, and he moved in a rush, and he, he didn't even move his stuff out of his apartment, and, um, and there was a, a helmet left behind, or something like that. Just, I mean, that's ridiculously obvious, but I'm just, just trying to give an example. Um, call Ellis County Crime Stoppers if you have something like that. Cole says, makes me sad to think of those little girls having to grow up without their mother. Yeah. Um, and, and let me just say, so many people looking at this from the very shallow end of the pool um, say things like, oh, Brandon has moved on. He's forgotten Missy. You know, the girls have moved on. Nobody's thinking about Missy anymore. Um, not true. Um, I have some familiarity with the family and I can tell you that this murder and this loss of Missy took a tremendous toll and continues to take a tremendous toll. And there have been consequences and there have been scars and things, things that aren't out there and that I would never put out there. But believe me, they have suffered in ways that you do not know. So don't find fault with this family. When Brandon said that he was moving on in one quote of an article, that was around the time he was remarrying, which was a few years after Missy died, and he's a single dad raising girls. I mean, if I was a single dad raising girls as a widower, I would I would hope that I would find somebody to help me raise those kids. And, and that's what he did. Um, and, and at that time, he's thinking, 
you know, I can't stop at a gas station or a grocery store parking lot and look around for uh, a Nissan Altima every day. I can't consume myself with that. That's all he meant when he said that he wasn't going to look for that anymore. Not writing down license plate numbers anymore. He wasn't saying that he didn't want anybody to look. He wasn't saying he didn't want police to, to look anymore. He was just saying that it couldn't consume him in a way that it had before. So, um, so for him and the girls, I feel bad for them too, Cole. And um, I just hope that people will show all of them mercy and pray for them because they continue to be affected by Missy's murder. Thank you for the thank you, Ray. Um, I just, you know, I found some purpose in following this case and um, anything I can do to help and publicize it, I do. Black Box Online Radio has a definite answer been found as to why the killer had an unusual walking gait. The answer is no. Um, it could be the shoes are too big. It could be he's faking it. Um, it could be um, maybe he was wearing a jock strap that he wasn't used to, to wearing. Maybe he's just not used to that clothing, period. Um, maybe he has a past injury. Maybe there's Maybe he's always had feet turned out. There's any number of answers to that, and, and there's just no way to know. No way to know. Jackie asks, how much was the life insurance policy? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if she had life insurance. I don't know how much life insurance. I don't know. But I'll say this. Most people have life insurance. And only a tiny percentage of people who have life insurance end up getting murdered. So... It's not really logical for us to take a murder and then say, well, was there life insurance? I always hear people say, I always ask myself when there's a murder, who benefits? Well, right there, you are already committed to the targeted scenario if you're saying that. Because if it's an untargeted theory, nobody benefits. If it's an untargeted burglary, that guy didn't benefit by Missy being in that church. Um, he got lucky, but he didn't benefit if it's a burglary. So who benefits doesn't always work. It only works if the person intended to kill Missy all along. Make a joke. That'll help. Okay. I don't know what we're helping, but uh, I'll tell you a joke. Um, Two cannibals were eating a clown. One looks to the other and says, does this taste funny to you? That's my joke. Rob S. says, what is so unusual about the way he walked? Why is it such a big deal to everyone? It doesn't look so unusual. That's an excellent point, Rob. Excellent point. Police made it a big deal, didn't they? Um, in those early press conferences... They, they said it's such an unusual gait, a feminine sway. They also referred to it as a feminine sway based on not a lot of, of, uh, of footage. Now, they have footage that we don't have. So I guess it's possible that there's something in the unreleased footage that makes them more confident that that's a real unusual gait. But to me... You know, they talked a lot about the right foot because at that one point where he's close to the camera, it looks like he's favoring the right foot a little bit. But later on, when you see him walking back up the hallway straight toward the camera, both feet are turned out equally to me. doesn't look like there's a limp. It just looks like a person with two feet that are turned out. And to me, that's not unusual. You can go on YouTube and you can... Uh, you can search up videos of people walking and you'll get somebody with a GoPro in New York City on the sidewalk with just masses of people walking. Watch one of those videos and see how many people that you can spot 
who have outturned feet just like this person. There's a lot of them. You'd be surprised. Do I agree it was a woman murder? You know, I think that I'm still on the fence. And, and I refer to to the person as he um, verbally, but that's that's just to be simple. I mean, you know, I'm not one of those people that says he or she all the time because I think that gets annoying to keep saying he or she. So I just say he. Uh, but to me, I, I'm really on the fence. I think it's just as likely that it's a woman as it is a man. Um, there are definitely parts of that video where it looks like the person is standing the way a woman might stand, but it's not very good video. It's not very good quality. And I just don't think we can infer too much from it um, to, to determine gender from that. And, you know, I, I think most people that weigh in on this subject, they're pretty evenly divided too, just, just like I am. So Black Box Online Radio, the unusual walk was that the toes were pointing outward and the killer wobbled as he walked. Okay. Well, I mean, the feet were pointing outward. Yeah. I mean, the toes kind of go along with the whole shoe and the foot. Uh, so, so definitely the feet were turned out. Um, I don't know about the wobbling though. I, I'd have to know more about what you're talking about there. Hmm. So Ray Ross, when a video is looked at closely, enhanced as much as possible, can a gun be detected? I don't see one. Again, this video is not very good quality. Um, I think that anything that might seem to show a gun is, is just a matter of perception. You already have it in your mind that she was shot and the killer definitely had a gun. We know that much. Uh, which, by the way, if anybody in here doesn't know that, um, it is confirmed that Missy was shot and it was the killer's gun, not Missy's gun. And that gun was not recovered. So um, if you know that already and then you're looking at really blurry, uh, distorted still images, well, guess what? You're going to think something looks like a gun. DR Tuttle says some angles of the video, the legs look fit. And in some angles, the person looks chubby. May be the costume. Yeah, good point. Um, you know, if you've got like loose fitting uh, BDU pants that, that kind of bunch up uh, at certain places along the leg as you move along, then that bunching up might make a portion of the leg look bigger, fatter, more muscular than it actually is. We also have to realize, and this is something I, I learned years ago on the Web Sleuths forum um, from um, a woman who designs medical textbooks and is, a, is a, an expert in medical illustrations and using Photoshop and um, real high-end graphic and drawing programs. She actually looked at that video and stripped away the clothing digitally and came up with a profile of this person that's pretty slim. Um, and she also pointed out that a camera pointed down from above, as we see in that church, makes a person look uh, thicker than they really are. Chubbier, thicker, stockier, whatever you want to say, um, than if the camera was at eye level. So add that to the fact that that gear is kind of bulky, that vest that the person has on, and we're not sure what they have on underneath it, that might be thick as well. I think this person is a lot thinner than a lot of people think he is or she is. Jet Petty, the perpetrator didn't appear to use the tool very confidently when breaking the window on the door in the video. 
That's why I thought the killer was female, but I don't know. Okay, interesting comment. And, and let me tell you my thoughts on that. It's, and this is where it's important to, to think about and know the, the layout of that church, the movement of that killer around the church, and, and what they were doing at different times. First of all, and, and Jet Petty, you're right, that was a window on a door. A lot of people think because it's kind of out of frame, what, what the person's swinging at, they think that they're just putting a hole in the wall. And so they're thinking, yeah, they're faking it. They're just, you know, making damage for no reason at all because they're trying to fake a burglary. No, they're, they're not putting a hole in the wall. They had a hammer in their hand in all this video. Did you ever see them put a hole in any wall? Nope. They could have done it at any point. Just and that drywall would have a big hole in it. They never did that. They never did any damage that was gratuitous damage. And even in the point there of knocking out the glass of that door, the only reason to do that is because the door's locked. This was a storage room, room nine, if you have access to um, one of the church layouts, which, by the way, Dr. Tuttle, who's in here with us, uh, has a great layout that um, I'll put in the description later on um, for you all to look at. Um, that room nine is a storage room, and the person knocked the glass out so that they could reach in and unlock. You're right, Jet Petty, that they didn't put a lot of force into it. But why would you need to put a lot of force into it? You can see that even with the little tapping that they do, you can see little nuggets or little popcorn pellets of glass, you know, safety glass. All these, the glass these days is safety glass. It's not like big shards that come out. It, it kind of shatters into these little nuggets. And you can see, even though he's not putting much force into it, you can see some of those nuggets flying back and hitting the floor. Um, he broke into a door just like that to enter the church. It was the kitchen service door, a metal door on the north side um, where he knocked that glass out in order to reach in and open that service door and enter. He may have found out the hard way when he did that, that that stuff blows back. And even though it's safety glass, it might hurt. It might cause a little pinprick of blood. Um, you have to be careful about that if you're our killer and you don't want to leave DNA. So maybe he learned from that mistake and maybe that's why when he's knocking out the glass of that other door, he does it only using as much force as he needs to use in order for it to break and not blow back and hit him. That's my theory. I could be wrong, but that's my theory. What else we got, guys? Well, there's Lindsay Horton. I see you on Facebook all the time doing great work for animals that need homes. And I think that's an awesome thing. If you're the Lindsay Horton that, that I see on Facebook. Um, she says, when I was dating, a red flag for me was wannabe police officers. I discussed this with friends in other areas, and apparently it is quite common for some men. I wonder if this is some kink. It's possible. It's possible. I do hear people talk about uh, LARPing, L-A-R-P, which is, uh, the R-P is role play. Somebody help me out with the uh, L L-A. What is that? Something assisted role play? Um, basically cosplay, dressing up. But, but here's the thing about that. As far as I know, to my knowledge, people who do cosplay do it as a group. They don't do it solo, individually. I don't, I don't think you can find an example of somebody breaking into a commercial building or a church or anything like that to just go around in costume pretending to be a police officer or, or anything else. So that's, that's the only caveat I have with that theory. If it was a random murder as a result of a burglary, wouldn't it statistically be a man, especially if the sporting store might have been the initial target? That is another excellent comment, Sharon. Um, yes, statistically, 
it's more likely that it would be a man if it was a burglary. Now, with statistics, there's still, you know, there's still the small percentage of it being the other way. And even if statistics indicate something is likely, there's still that, it's kind of like uh, weather forecasts for rain. You know, it may be a 10% chance of rain. So 90 times out of 100, you're going to walk outdoors without your umbrella and you're going to be fine. But 10 times out of 100, you're going to walk out without your umbrella and you're going to get wet. That rain is going to be just as wet, even though there's a 10% chance that day. Um, so <laughs> so the camera video feed is bad, huh? Well, I don't have much light in here. That doesn't help. So, but yeah, I'm just using a laptop uh, webcam. Um, doesn't have the, the most megapixels. Lindsay says that uh, she thinks that Missy interrupted something, whether a robbery or some cosplaying. And again, those are those are possibilities. Although robbery, um, we need to distinguish the terms robbery versus burglary. Robbery is when there's someone present and you're holding them up and you're taking money from them. Like if you're going into a convenience store and you go up to the cashier and make them give you the money out of the cash register, that's a robbery. A burglary is when you are breaking into an uninhabited building, you know, either residential or commercial, uh, trying to look things to take without wanting to encounter someone or, or thinking that it's, that it's empty. By the way, 12, only 12% 12 of burglaries are planned. Think about that. 12% of burglaries are planned, meaning 88% of all burglaries are basically crimes of opportunity. Someone sees a target, they think, you know, this is this is a good potential target, and so they they go burglarize it. They don't necessarily case it for days the way we might think. And that church had nothing on any side of it or across the road from it. It was rural. It was isolated. Monday morning, middle of the night, there's nobody going to be there, right? If you're a burglar, that's what you're thinking. You're certainly not going to think that somebody's going to be at a church on a Monday morning uh, to do an exercise class. Not, not that early. Maybe at, you know, 7 in the morning, but not at 4. 4.30. How likely do you think the Altima is related to the murder? Very likely. And, and I'll tell you why. Not only do we have this really suspicious behavior a mile away from the church happening a couple of hours before the murder. But, you know, some people might say, well, a couple of hours, you know, it's not, not really that strong evidence, maybe it's just coincidence. There was a warrant that came out in 2019, not a lot of people have seen the warrant, that, that says that 19 minutes after that car left SWFA, the motion-activated cameras in the church turned on. They did not record something specific when they turned on, but something caused them to activate. 19 minutes. Maybe someone broke into the building testing for an alarm. And maybe the, the vibration and the shattering or whatever was enough to cause cameras to turn on. Um, maybe it was enough. Maybe they had a flashlight. Well, we know they had a, a light on their helmet, right? Um, maybe the light flashed across the camera and caused it to turn on, but because those motion-activated cameras have a bit of a delay before they start recording, maybe the light was already not, not on that field of view of the camera by the time the camera started recording. Those are some thoughts I have about that. Um, 
So I think it's very likely that the Altima is related to the murder. It's still possible that it isn't. Um, there have been suspicious things that have happened at SWFA before, by the way, and not a lot of people know this. But when you look up incidents in that area, public record from Midlothian Police Department, from SWFA, uh, there was a car that pulled into SWFA about four months before Missy was murdered with several people in it hiding their faces from cameras, okay? And one person gets out and goes in and starts asking questions about their security. Starts asking really, really suspicious questions about their security system. So, um, and, and then they get in the car and by the time they call police and police get there, the car is long gone. Um, and, and, and by the way, though, that same day at night after closing, uh, somebody was back at SWFA messing with some kind of a security box or something on the property. And by the time police got there, they were gone. So, uh, there, there's a history of, of things happening at SWFA. There's a history of things happening at the church that you may not know. Um, someone stole a very expensive golf cart battery from the church. Those things can be a few thousand dollars. Somebody stole a trailer, like, you know, that a truck carries behind it, a trailer that you might have, uh, you know, items that, that you haul around. Um, somebody stole that. Um, that happened prior to the murder. The golf cart battery incident happened after the murder. Um, you know, in rural areas, people will take advantage. They will. And again, 12% of burglaries are planned. 88% are unplanned. People see something and they think, Maybe they can take advantage of the situation. Uh, Black Box Online. I said some critical things about Aaron, but will I watch it when it comes out, his final verdict? Sure I will. And, and I don't mean to just totally trash Aaron Stoner. He puts a lot of effort into what he does. And, and so I, I don't mean to trash him at all. I think that his conclusions that he's drawing are incorrect. Um, but I think there's value in, in trying to look at all this stuff. And the um, thing about Aaron Stoner is he's an actor. Um, he's not somebody who went to school to learn how to use high-end video graphics programs. Um, he, he's basically self-taught and he uses filtering. And you got to know that with, when you do that with graphic images, you create artifacts. You create things that were not there before. Um, and so that, that that's my only thing. I, I don't I don't mean to be um, critical of him for his effort. I'm just uh, I just don't agree with his conclusions about the prosthetic limb. I don't agree that he was able to see enough of a face uh, in the car window for him to have somebody produce a sketch. I don't believe any of that. I don't believe that he came up with enough of the license plate to be able to say that it has a handicap symbol on it. I don't believe that either. Um, but I still applaud him for um, for trying and uh, for generating interest in the case. What else do we have here? Uh, Shiva's girl is talking about the thumbnail. Uh, the thumbnail of this video, or are you talking about the, the Green Man animation? Yeah, that comes from, uh, her name was uh, Bat Brat on, on Web Sleuths. I'll throw up a little uh, banner here. Um, I just want to give her credit because she did hours and hours of work. And I've got actual animations that she did. And I can put those in the description later on if you'd like to see those. Or on my channel, there's a video I did for the five-year anniversary two years ago um, about the Green Man animation. There's a, a portion of that video where I show that whole animation. So feel free to go, go look at that. And it really 
it really is interesting. Um, you have to believe that that Bat Brat knew what she was doing in order to fully buy into what it shows you. Um, but it's pretty compelling what she came up with. And it shows a lot about how the feet move when you're not looking at shoes and pants and all, all that stuff. When you're just looking at an outline of the limbs, it's, it, it's really interesting. <laughs> Lindsay Horton says, yep, that's me, the animal nut. Hey, I'm an animal nut, too. I've got a cat and a dog. Both of them were rescues. Um, north Central Texas. Uh, I don't know what you consider North Central Texas. Uh, I'm definitely uh, north. I'm up in the panhandle. Um, so I'm several several hours north of Dallas. It's where I am now. It's not where I'm from. I'm originally from South Carolina. And uh, go Gamecocks. Jackie Johnson asks, who called in about Bobby? Probably a co-worker. I got a partial answer to that. A partial answer. So you remember that there was a memorial service for Missy that was on Wednesday, after the murder happened on Monday. And that was held at Creekside Church. And there's video of a guy walking around who's Bobby Wayne Henry. And the cameraman, you know, you have to feel like police talked to the media and said, look, while, while you're shooting video, if you could help us out and, and kind of catch the walk of, of people, and see if you see anybody with a weird walk. And this cameraman, whoever he is, you can see him like focusing down at just the feet of, of Bobby walking around. And sure enough, he's got those outturned feet. And so that video was posted online, um, and a lot of people saw it. And I think that generated tons of tips. Um, I don't know that there were tips before then. There might have been, but... I bet you that their phone rang off the hook with people calling and saying, that guy that's on that video walking around walks just like the killer. But I've also heard that some of his co-workers in law enforcement, some of his former co-workers in law enforcement actually called in tips about him too. And imagine if you're in Midlothian Police Department and you get a tip from a fellow law enforcement agency saying, yeah, we used to work with that guy. He's he's a real creep, and there's stuff in his background, and look at the way that he walks. We think it's him. Midlothian is going to have to look into that. So so that, that's possible, some combination of uh, people that knew Bobby, thinking that it looked like him, and then that video of him at the memorial service. All right. DR Tuttle, 1.58 a.m., the silver Nissan Altima enters the SWFA parking lot. Okay, so this is the timeline of the car at SWFA. It's two minutes before 2 a.m. when the car enters the parking lot. 2.04 a.m. is when the car exits the parking lot. So it sits there for six minutes. Some people say, well, they were testing for an alarm and testing for police response at the church. No, they weren't. Nobody waits for six minutes for a police response. Police are not that fast. And SWFA is a horrible place for them to wait to look for a police response because the church was way back behind them from where they parked. And they're down in a hole. And the church is down in a hole on the other side of the raised Freeway, US 287. They were not checking for a police response. But what makes sense to me is if the car is related, they were thinking about SWFA, they were focused on SWFA. For whatever reason, they gave up on SWFA. They went to the church around 223 is when those 
those motion activated cameras go off. And after they do that, you know, smashing some windows, some doors, triggering the motion activated cameras, then they leave and they go somewhere else. There's a Whataburger up the road. Maybe they went there. It's 24 hours. Maybe they just drove around. So they could have come back at three something. They could have let 45 minutes go by and, and come back around 3.15 a.m. and seen that the church was untouched. Nobody came. And so then they break in and they mess around in the kitchen, you know, whatever, and then make their entry into the interior at 3.50 a.m. That's what I think the likely timeline is of what happened. They went to SWFA, then they went to the church, and they broke into the church without actually going in in order to test for an alarm. They drove away somewhere, and they came back later. All right. <clears throat> what does SWFA stand for? What kind of business is it? SWFA stands for South... West Firearms. I think that's right. Or, or Southwest Firearms and Ammunition. But anyway, it's a, it's a gun store and an outdoor store. Um, they sell clothing for like hunting. They sell rifles. They sell guns. They sell crossbows. Um, that big, that big symbol that is painted onto the concrete there in the parking lot that you see when you watch the SWFA video, that is the, the site of a scope. So it's all about hunting. It's all about the outdoors. Um, that, that's what SWFA is. And by the way, they no longer have that retail store open. They still have an online business. Um, but last I knew, they were closing down the store part of it, so you couldn't just walk in and shop at that store anymore. And I assume that that's still the case. Were police able to get an idea of the perp's height from the video? Yes, they were. They brought in the Tarrant County Sheriff's Office, which had a video forensics specialty team that had special software and cameras and stuff that they went into the church, I believe May the 12th of 2016, and took a lot of measurements, um, set their cameras up, ran things through their software. Ultimately, what they've come up with is that this person from the floor to the top of the helmet, so clothed from the floor to the top of the helmet, is around 5'8". And they they say that there's room for error of about an inch and a half either way. So let's talk tallest possible scenario. In that scenario, this person is 5'9 and a half from the floor to the top of their helmet. How thick's the helmet, though? We don't know. Helmets are typically pretty thick, though. If they weren't thick, then what good are they? You know, we need for them to be protective, you know, so that we can go about our skull cracking activities and not die. So maybe three inches, three and a half inches, perhaps just in the thickness of the helmet. And then you talk about the boots the person's wearing. Boots are not flat against the floor. There's a heel. Sometimes there's there's some padding there. Um so I, I've heard some people from the military who, who have had uniforms and had, you know, combat type boots and had helmets say that it wouldn't be unusual for that outfit to add five inches. So let's, let's take five inches away from five, nine and a half. And, and what, where does that leave us? Five, in, five inches from five, nine and a half leaves us at a height, you know, the person just naked, barefoot, five, four and a half. That's pretty short, pretty short for it to be a man. Um, and if we go less than the maximum possible scenario, it's possible that it's five, six and a half minus however many inches for the, for the boots and for the helmet. So 
this person could be like five two, five three. And and remember, they said early on that they thought the person was somewhere between five two and five seven. And what I think they were referring to was the unclothed barefoot height, uh, the actual height of a person when they said that. Uh, but walking around with our with our clothes on, um, you know, this person is still a short person. It's only when you add in a really thick helmet that it becomes something else. So, yeah, that's that's what I think. Um, I think they have a pretty good idea, you know, just just going from the work that they put in with Tarrant County. Rob says the Altima driver would have come forward if he was innocent. Uh, what if uh, what if he's not even from the area? I just don't know about uh, you know the fact that the world doesn't revolve around the Missy Beavers murder. We can't just assume that somebody knows about that murder. Um, just because they stopped at SWFA on a drive somewhere. I mean, if we're thinking that this person is innocent and they're in no way connected to a murder that just so happened a couple of hours later at the next closest building up the road, you know, we, we can't just hang our hat on the fact that this person would have read about it in the news. Because you'd be surprised how many people have never heard of Missy Beavers. I mean, not by name, and they don't even know the scenario, you know. I go up to a random person. I say, do you know that place in the Dallas area? It was a church and there's a person on video walking around in a what looks like a SWAT or police outfit. And they end up killing the woman. She was there for a fitness class. People give me a blank look. You know, it's hard for us to believe as true crime people, um, but not everybody's into true crime. <laughs> not everybody uh, is into the news. So there's that. Yeah, you know, going back to talking about the height, Dr. Tuttle says, but they still went after Bobby Wayne Henry, who is six one. And you're right, they did. They they, they followed up on tips. Um, because what else did they have? They were trying to follow up on everything that was coming in, and there were other boxes that he checked. So many other boxes with, you know, sexual assault history and things like that. That. And, and it took me for a long time to, to get a grasp of this in following true crime. Just because police follow a tip and just because they even execute a warrant, that doesn't mean that they really truly believe that that person did it. They're just following their avenues of investigation that are available to them and seeing where those end up. So... I give Midlothian police a pass on the fact that Bobby Wayne Henry was taller than than the killer, so it it definitely could not have been him. But for them, they, they still needed to investigate it. They still needed to eliminate him so that it wouldn't be hanging out there for later on. Uh, they couldn't know that he, he might have been an accomplice of someone, and maybe even if he wasn't the person in the church, maybe he was that elusive second person. Um, so again, I don't fault MPD for following that to see where it led. The bridge guy. So in, in the Delphi murders, the bridge guy. Yeah, he's a short guy too. You know, when you start just going around and looking at people in terms of height, it's kind of like the outturned feet. You find that lots and lots of people are short. Even men there's men that are very short. Kiefer Sutherland. You know, 24 was one of my favorite shows. I was just talking with a good friend of mine last night about 24 and uh, how I followed that for years. Kiefer Sutherland is close to 5'4", if not 5'4", to the point that they had to, they had to be tricky with camera angles to make Kiefer look like he's not some shorty compared to everybody else because it made him look weak. If they if they accentuated that, 
So, yeah, even Keith or Sutherland, even Jack Bauer, 5-4. But Jack Bauer did not kill Missy Beavers. If they were there to rob the church, why kill her? Roxanne Smith says. I'm glad you said that. That That's a valid question. It's a question that comes up a lot. People who believe in the targeted theory do have an issue with the fact that this person committed a murder. If they were just there as a burglar, why did they commit a murder? My answer to that is it happens every day. It's called felony murder. It's when a murder is committed in the act of committing some other crime, some other crime that is less serious than murder because murder is the most serious crime, right? It happens every day. A guy goes into a convenience store to rob the clerk. He may not intend to shoot, but he's got that gun out and he's a little jittery and it doesn't take much pressure. Some of you gun people probably know exactly how many pounds of pressure it takes on a trigger. Um, and it probably differs, I'm sure, from weapon to weapon, rifle to handgun, but it could have happened without the person even intending for it to happen is what, is what I'm saying. But they could have intended to do it. Maybe they were a psychopath. Maybe they didn't care. Maybe she forced the issue. Maybe Missy, you know, knowing she's fit and everything, maybe she decided she, she was going to stand her ground. Maybe she was facing the wrong way in between blocking him from his exit and he's blocking her from, from her ex exit. And maybe they just got into a, a tussle there and the gun went off. Um, there's no way to know what happened there. But I can tell you that just because a person commits murder doesn't mean that that person isn't a burglar. We can't eliminate the burglary theory because life is just not like that. And when you're in the heat of the moment, um, it's a desperate situation. And if that person had no idea that anybody was going to be in that church, and then all of a sudden, bam, there's somebody right there. It's it's just, you know, he can't stop time. He can't start thinking, well, if I leave now, she's not going to be able to recognize me. Um, but if I kill her, well, gosh, that's going to be capital murder here in Texas, and I could get the death penalty. It doesn't happen like that in real life. They don't work through some checklist of what what the pros and cons of, of doing whatever they're thinking about doing. It's split seconds, split seconds to make a decision. And let's face it, if this guy's a burglar, he's already shown that he's, he's not a good decision maker. Because why? Because he broke into a church. Um, you know, that's bad. You know, just breaking into any building that's, that you don't belong in is bad, but a sacred house, um, that's... That's even worse, right? He doesn't have any reason to be there. Um, but he's there anyway, so he's already showed bad decision-making. So why should we expect him to all of a sudden demonstrate good decision-making and, and decide, well, I'm not going to kill her. I'm just going to, I'm just going to run. He's already been a bad decision-maker. And one bad decision often leads to another one. Oh, I was looking through here. Okay. Beekeeping lady says uh, she's 5'4 and her husband is 5'5. Five five. I'm curious to know, do you have kids? If you have kids, how tall are they? And I, I wonder, um, does the shortness get, get passed on? Or, or do you have kids that are much taller than either of you are? I find genetics and the whole thing very interesting. Although I, I really got lost back in science class learning about the, the fruit fly and, you know, all the things about the, the genes that, that get passed down. That's hard to follow, but it's interesting. In the burglary theory, it's possible Missy caught the perp off guard. The perp might have thought Missy had a phone on her, which most people do, and wanted to stop her from calling 911. Possible. Who did video enhancements? 
Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to, unless you're referring to the earlier discussion about um, Aaron Stoner. Aaron Stoner has done some things to enhance some of the video. Um, but again, I, I take that with a grain of salt as to what it shows. How old was Bobby's baby when the murder happened? Okay, let me think. To the best of my knowledge, the baby was still an infant, like less less than a year old, uh, not walking yet. Um, I'm thinking that they had adopted in October of the previous year, and this was April. So six months from however old the baby was when they first, when the baby was first placed with them. Um, so I'm thinking somewhere between six months and, and a year, but closer to six months than a year is about the best I can do. Okay. Well, thank you for answering my question, beekeeping lady. So you have three kids and everybody is 5'4". Okay. Isn't it weird, though, how sometimes you, you see a family where they're both short and then they have just like this really, really, really tall kid? Um, Cole asked, do you know if the offerings were kept in the church? I do know the answer to that. Um, the answer is that no, they did not keep them on site. Um, after church the previous day, they would have compiled a deposit bag um, and then taken that to the bank to drop in the night drop. I have confirmed that with my sources. However, a burglar would not have known that. So keep that in mind. This, this is my theory. My theory is that the burglar was not interested in things. And this is what trips a lot of people up. They think, well, the burglar didn't take anything, so it must not have been a burglary. I think that the person was after cash. That's the number one thing on a wish list for burglars is cash, because they don't have to go pawn something. They don't have to worry about something being traceable back to them. So I think that he had never been in that church before. He broke in, figuring that somewhere in an office type area is where the cash would be kept if it was there. And he's just exploring room by room. And it's why he spends very little time in those classrooms that we see him going by and checking. Because you open a door and you're looking for a bank deposit bag and all you see is a classroom with some chairs and maybe a whiteboard, um, and a lectern, um, you know, you're quickly going to move on because it's not going to be there. Um, something that's not common knowledge, the most disturbed room in the church was in the office area. It was a room that had nothing but filing cabinets in it. So again, why would a person targeting Missy go to the trouble of going into filing cabinets and messing things up, throwing and strewing files around and whatever he did in there. I don't know if he actually knocked any file cabinets over, but what, what I was told by a source that would know is that it was the most disturbed room in the church. And that's that does not track for me with somebody that is lying in wait for Missy Beavers. They wouldn't care about what's in the office. And think of the noise they'd be making. In, a, in an area where they're totally out of strategic location to where Missy is, they couldn't get the jump on her that way. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I've already said yes, but, you know, privacy and, and all that, pri private health stuff, I, I really wish I hadn't answered that. Let's just move on. Um, church was an easy target. Yeah. 
you know, burglars, when burglars are determining the attractiveness of, of a location to burgle, uh, they look at something called overlooks. Overlooks are houses or buildings, potential places where people would be that are within eyesight of that building that the burglar wants to burgle. It increases the risk. You know, the more overlooks you have, if you have a house next door, if you have a business across the street, um, you run the risk that someone is going to see you moving around in there, burglaring the, um, the place. So burglarizing the place. So that's compelling about the church is that there was nothing to the left of it, nothing to the right of it, nothing behind it, nothing across the, the road from it. There was nothing. The closest building, um, there's actually a compound of some houses that are right next to SWFA. But right there, that compound and SWFA are almost a mile from the church. And then Midway Airport is on the same side of the road as the church, but it's a little further down from SWFA, so it's even more than a mile away. Um, and then DR Tuttle, you know the area, going back the other direction toward Whataburger, um, what's the nearest thing going that direction? Because Whataburger is like a mile away. Um, I don't think that there's a lot there. And there's definitely nothing next door to that church. So in some ways, this person ended up being very lucky that he got away. In some ways, he ends up being very unlucky because you would think that nobody would, that you wouldn't come across anybody, that you wouldn't be interrupted breaking into a church like that, in that location, at that time of morning of that day. So. Okay. DR Tuttle says there's a gas station on the left at Walnut Grove. So, how close in uh, percentages of a mile would you say? Is it is it closer to the church that direction than SWFA is the other direction, or is it further away? Also a Texas smokehouse. And these were things that existed in 2016. We have to be sure that we're that we're looking back at things that existed then. Um, like right now, there's something called Firefly Gardens that's across from the church that's like a wedding chapel and event center, uh, but it wasn't there in 2016. And I've heard people over and over say they should. Tr I wonder if police tried to get video footage, surveillance footage from the uh, the event center across the road. No, they didn't because it didn't exist. Yes to what, Dr. Tuttle? Yes, it's closer than SWFA. We'll wait for an answer on that. We're going to try to go to about 25 more minutes. That will put us at two hours. Okay, DR Tuttle says no, not closer. So it's not closer. So, you, but you, so ultimately, you've got a buffer of at least a mile on either side of this church. And then you've got trees and woods across the highway from it. And you've got trees and woods back behind it um, that are pretty rugged, pretty rugged ground. Um, what else do, does anybody want to talk about? Again, thanks to everybody for being here to talk about the Missy Beavers case. I'm really glad that you're here. Um, there's something 
I don't know, something fulfilling and uplifting just about gathering together to talk about um, to talk about Missy so that she's not forgotten. And yeah. Well, you haven't missed it. We're going to hang around for at least another 25 minutes. Um, if you've got any questions, and I imagine you can probably scroll back through the live chat. I think that's how it works. Even though you just entered the room, you should be able to look back at the history of the live chat and see what all we've talked about. But if you have a question you want to ask live, I'm glad you're here. I don't know if I mentioned this earlier or not, but this kind of bugged me. Um, so WFAA, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, dear Tuttle, but I think WFAA is the NBC affiliate in the Dallas area, which would cover Midlothian. Uh, they did a little, little thing on the news today, um, and it's, it's on YouTube you know, just kind of an update or not much of an update because there isn't one, but they said something that really bugged me. They said, even police believe Missy was targeted. Police have said from the beginning that they are wide open, that they haven't ruled in or out any theory. After seven years, If anything, if they lean anyway, it would be toward it not being targeted after such a long period of time because they vetted everybody. They've investigated, investigated. Now, I'm not saying that they lean toward untargeted, but I'm saying that they have said publicly to anyone who would listen for years that they're wide open. The most recent um, that... Chief Smith, Chief Carl Smith, the police chief there, was uh, was quoted. He said, we're not any closer now than we were at the beginning. That's a paraphrase, but that that's that's the, the meaning of what he said, that they are not any closer now. So they're stymied and they're not, there's, you know, there's not a group of people over at Midlothian Police that just flat out believe that this is some targeted attack and that they just don't don't have the person yet. Um, and for one thing, that would be really bad police work because you don't get tunnel vision. You don't, you don't narrow yourself and, and eliminate um, other potential theories. Not until something just really comes along that is so compelling that you can't look the other way. Okay, so our newcomer, VTPSTTU, says, we learned now that Delphi had some big evidence that they were able to keep secret for years. Do you think MPD might have something similar? Um, yeah, we talked about this a little bit earlier, uh, that uh, they do have some DNA that they collected. They haven't talked about it much at all, but uh, they did collect a partial mixed sample of DNA. How useful it has been or how useful it will be remains to be seen. Okay, D.R. Tuttle's giving us some, some quotes of what police have said. We have and will continue to go wherever the case takes us, said Brown. And that's Scott Brown. He's the assistant police chief and kind of spokesperson who replaced Kevin Johnson, who was in that role at the beginning of the case, but then retired later. We still receive tips from across the globe, and we follow up on all of them that have even the slightest legitimacy. Best guess is we received over 50 tips from various sources in 22 and 23. Many of the subjects of these tips are local, but some are not. In the past 18 months, we visited several locations and interviewed several people outside of the state of Texas in connection with the case. Yeah, this is what they said at the five-year mark. And um, I know that some within Midlothian police were not happy that Scott Brown put that out there, that they went outside the state to follow up on the tip. 
And I can tell you that what they were following up on had to do with that female suspect that we mentioned earlier, or female person of interest. Um, they were interviewing some people in, in regard to that uh, when they left the state of Texas to do that. But again, that was that was three years ago, and they've done nothing since. Okay, you're saying that's a new quote from from D, from uh, Scott Brown that in the past. 18 months, they visited several locations and interviewed several people outside of the state. Okay. But he's saying something very similar to what he said two years ago. If he did say it again, you know, I mean, it's it's not a totally cold case. They have resources assigned, and, and so it's not unusual or un, it's not surprising to me that they would follow up on some tips out of state. Um, what else, guys? What do you think is the biggest question that you have in this case that you wish you could get an answer to? Not necessarily something that I can answer, but just the biggest question that you have. We've got more and more people joining us. So, I mean, I'll keep going as long as we have discussion topics to talk about. And please go back and look at the description later on, because as I have time, I'm going to post some links to um, some stuff that you'll find good. You'll find very good. In fact, I'll post um, an image of that mystery object that shows you what it is. Uh, it's the storage bin that the person's carrying around that has some small tools in it, such as sockets. Okay, Cole says, I was looking at the characteristics of a burglar, usually a repeat offender, and lives close by. I wonder how many burglaries there have been in the area since then. We well, you know crime has risen in Midlothian. Um, it's risen since that time uh, as the town has grown. <clears throat> but let, let me tell you two stories. Number one is a story of Easter Sunday of that same year, two weeks before Missy was murdered. So the first Sunday of April 2016, a woman has bought groceries at a Walmart in Midlothian broad daylight, like three o'clock in the afternoon. And she's taking her groceries to her SUV. And there's a little silver car that's pulled up at the building next door to Walmart that's caught on video over there. And some guys in hoodies jump out, you can't see their faces. Um, they go over into the Walmart parking lot and they carjack this woman. They get in her SUV and they leave. And a good Samaritan goes to try to follow them, but then that silver car that dropped them off kind of gets in between and, and runs interference. And they got away, and they never got caught. <laughs> so that's a crime that, that happened two weeks before in broad daylight in the Walmart parking lot. And then the other thing is, like three or four months after Missy was murdered, there was a gun store pawn shop robbery that happened in Waxahachie, seven people in a truck smash into the building to gain entrance to the building and, and they take guns and all kinds of stuff. They got caught. I'm not sure how they got caught, but they got caught pretty quickly. And it turned out that only one of them was from the area and the other six were from Dallas. We have to remember that Highway 287 is 1,000 miles long. OK, I live in the Amarillo area and 287 begins 
or you might say ends, however you want to look at it, in Amarillo. I can hop on 287 and I can go all the way down a highway called US 287 um, to get to Midlothian. It's the longest three-digit highway in America. It's a popular trucker's route. Um, people can hop on 287 and then get on the interstate. Um, I don't remember the exact path to get from Midlothian to Dallas proper, but it's like 40 minutes. And um, think about this. If you want to commit a crime and you're in Dallas where there's a lot of police resources, are you going to commit that crime in Dallas? Or if you could go to one of the outlying suburbs that doesn't have a lot of police resources, would you go there and burglarize or commit some other kind of crime? Something to think about. Do you think there's any chance that this was an illegal alien? Okay, these days we call them undocumented immigrants. Um, we see very little skin of, of the, the killer, okay? The very little bit of skin that we see, to me, looks pretty light-skinned. I don't know that that really tells us a whole lot one way or the other. Um, I think asking whether this was an undocumented immigrant is a shot in the dark. It's like asking whether this person knows how to juggle. I, I mean, you just, just don't know. DR Tuttle wants to know who did it. Yep, that's... That's a big question to ask. <laughs> what kind of car did the killer drive? Well, I think it's a pretty good chance that it's that 2010 to 2012 Nissan Altima, but that's just me. What evidence do we have that Missy threatened the murderer, which is why he, she responded with lethal force? We don't have any evidence. Um, one thing we cannot say is anything about the nature of the encounter when the actual confrontation between those two people happened. We don't know. It was not caught on camera. Um, I don't know that anything about the crime scene that police were able to see really shows them much. Um, I can tell you that the glass that was around Missy's body came from a display case that somehow got shattered. Uh, I don't know if police are able to determine how it got shattered, um, whether it was by a gunshot, whether it was by Missy falling through it during the encounter. I don't know. I don't know if punches were thrown. I don't know if they were in each other's grasp. All of that is total conjecture, and we just don't know. She may not have threatened the person at all. She may have turned around and tried to run immediately. And he may have been a psychopath that just decided to shoot her for no reason other than to shoot her. Or he may have freaked out and, and had a finger spasm and the gun went off. Who knows? Does someone know the killer but is afraid to tell police? Maybe a partner or friend. You know, I know this one thing. The more people know about a murder, the more likely that someone's going to talk and the more likely that the killer is going to be caught. The murders that go unsolved for decades aren't because, you know, three people know about it and they just keep the secret for 35 years. The ones that persist in being unsolved, like the Golden State Killer, for one, or BTK, are because you have a solo killer who doesn't feel the need to brag, at least not 
verbally to somebody. Now, the BTK killer ended up taunting police, writing letters and stuff. That was his downfall. But if this person doesn't want notoriety, this person does not care anything about getting credit for what he did to the point that he won't even tell a lover, a spouse, then that makes it difficult to solve. I think if, I'll say this, there's a very hefty reward in this case, something like $150,000. If, if someone was afraid to tell police, but they knew, really knew who the killer was, I think that the monetary benefit of it being such a high reward, I think would overcome their fear. And I think that they would end up going to police for the most part. One of my big questions is where the small dark SUV was and what direction it was going, if that account was even legitimate. Was it going north or south? Was it still in the church parking lot? Yep, the small dark SUV was only mentioned one time in this case. It was mentioned in the search warrant for Bobby Wayne Henry's property. I have spoken to Bobby Wayne Henry found out a piece of very interesting information from him, if he's to be, be believed about this. And it's, I mean, it's not something major. It's not something I think that he would be motivated to lie about. He said that police tried and failed to get that search warrant on his property like three or four times. You know, a search warrant, you have to have an affidavit that establishes as police, what your probable cause is to be able to go execute that search warrant. A judge has to buy into what you have said is your probable cause. And then if he does, he signs it, and then it becomes public record, and then they go and execute it. If he rejects it, well, nobody in the public even knows about it. Um, and, you know, But what happened here was, according to Bobby Wayne Henry, they tried and failed several times um, until finally they produced somebody who was an eyewitness, supposedly, who saw a small dark SUV that morning. It was a pilot, a pilot who was, I'm not clear on whether he was on his way to work, to, to fly, or, or if he was on his way home after flying. But anyway, he's, he's driving past the church and he, he says he sees a small dark SUV. Once they put that nugget in there, that was enough, according to Bobby Wayne Henry's account, for the judge to sign that warrant, where they had, where the judge had not been willing to do so before that. So I thought that was interesting. Um, my understanding is that the dark SUV was pulling out of the church. So to answer your question about was it still in the lot, I think that it was in the lot but pulling into the highway. I don't know what direct. Well, I do know what. No, I don't know what, because in front of the church is the open area where you can go right or left. At SWFA, you are forced to turn right because there's a median uh, in, the, in the way in the middle. But at the church, no, you can make a left turn or a right turn. So I, I don't know which way. And, you know, with that guy that saw that dark SUV, people have said it many times, eyewitness testimony is the most unreliable form of testimony. And you might think, what? That doesn't make sense. I mean, you're seeing it with your own two eyes. How many times have you heard about an eyewitness who gets it wrong? Or they do a study, like in a, a criminal uh, criminal studies class or whatever in college, where, uh, where a group of, of men come running in, uh, like they're hijacking the class or whatever, or stealing things. They run in for a few minutes, and then they run out. And then they ask these people who were eyewitnesses, okay, how many men were they? Uh, what were they wearing? What were they doing? All this stuff. And they just get it wildly wrong because our memories are faulty. Um, if this person saw a small dark SUV, maybe he saw it at some other place and he just 
thought it was the church, but it was somewhere else. Maybe it wasn't even that same morning. Or he could be right, but it's hard, it's hard to, to rely on eyewitness testimony. Huh. Well, that's good. That's interesting. So you live on 287 as well, and you're in Wyoming. Wow, I didn't realize it went all, all the way to Wyoming. Um, D.R. Tuttle says they use the black SUV info to search Bobby Wayne Henry's house. He owned a black SUV. Actually, it was brown, but it was it was kind of a darker brown. So, um, so yeah, I mean, the, the reason why the judge signed off on that probable cause affidavit that mentioned a small dark SUV is because police could could show that Bobby Wayne Henry owned a small dark SUV. If he didn't own one, then it would have helped, for, you know, to bring up that eyewitness. Any bullet holes in walls, furniture, etc.? I do not believe so. I've seen nothing to indicate that. Police do know the caliber. I'll say that much. They know the caliber. Well, thank you for your kind words. You know, there's a lot of different voices that all have their different opinions. Um, I, I just try to be a documenter of this case, and I try to analyze it. Let's face it, not everybody who is interested in true crime is a good analyzer of a crime. Um, I feel like I'm a good analyzer. I think I can look at things from different perspectives. I can play devil's advocate, which ends up really ticking people off sometimes because I'm always the fly in the ointment, the, the guy who says, well, here's here's this hole in your theory. Here's this other hole in your theory. And that, that could rub people the wrong way. I, I don't mean for it to be personal. I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings. Some of the people you mentioned there um, don't like it that I'm that way. But I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm just trying to look at things from all sides because it's really hard for us to get out of our biases. There are things that I think now that didn't occur to me about this case five years ago, six years ago. I've been following it since day one, and my thoughts have evolved just from looking at it from every which way. And just when I think that I've only looked at it the only way that it can be looked at, then I think of something else or somebody reminds me of some other way to look at it. And I'm like, wow, you're right. That's something I hadn't considered. So that's just what I try to do. Who wants to live with a killer? Another killer. <laughs> so killers flock together. Is, is that your theory? I don't know. Was the pilot flying out of the airport near the church, or was he going to a major airport? I don't know that for sure. DR Tunnel thinks that the pilot was going to Dallas or coming from Dallas. So, so it may have been a pilot of, of a commercial airliner out of um, DFW or out of Love Field. <laughs> Good point. Yep. I remember that about Delphi, that they were all over the place about, and, and again, eyewitness testimony, people saying they saw a vehicle, and then they described that vehicle, and one person thinks that it's a PT Cruiser, another person thinks it's a small, dark 
SUV, um, which, you know, PT Cruisers kind of, I could see how there might be a similarity there, sort of, between a dark, a small, compact SUV and a PT Cruiser, but they are still pretty different. And and now they think it was a sedan. Well, shoot, that's not even anything like either one of those. Okay, here's somebody with some knowledge about calibers of guns. Um, hmm. 38 special bullet from a four inch barrel won't expand enough to stay in a victim's body. If the bullet continued beyond her body, it had to hit something. Hmm. Um, I know they recovered a bullet. Um, I don't know where they recovered that bullet from, for sure, whether it was from the body or outside the body, but they did recover a bullet. Dear Total wants to know if they caught the Nissan Altima on other video footage. They should have gone through all the surrounding area and followed the car as far as possible. Maybe they did. Yeah, I'm... But here's the thing that I think about with that. People think that surveillance footage at businesses is more valuable and useful than it really is. When you think about it, a gas station or other business is not interested in what's going on on the road out in front of them. They're interested in their property, protecting their property. And so you really can't see much. Um, you know, you, you guys have seen, you know, footage, surveillance footage from gas stations before. Um, like even in the, uh, the Idaho murders, those, those four college students. There's a gas station video and it shows that white car going by on the road. But gosh, I mean, you can't see a license plate. You can't tell anything. You just see a blurry vehicle. That's all. Um, so I think the question isn't necessarily is there video footage that shows that Nissan Altima, that little silver car out of a whole lot of other silver cars at 4.30 in the morning. The question is, is it on video where they can actually do something with it? where they can actually show that it is the same silver car and that it shows them more detail than what SWFA gave them. Now, if SWFA didn't give them uh, anything to go on on a rainy, dark night, then what, what's, what's this other footage going to give them if it even existed? This is also a good point. If the dark SUV was a solid lead, how come MPD never released that info in a press release? They never talked about it. Never talked about it at all. It was in that search warrant, but it was never talked about publicly. So that's a good point. How much video actually exists? Is there more that the police simply feel would not help the public identify the killer? Okay, that's a good point a good question and a good topic to bring up. There were only four interior cameras in that church. Okay. Two of them were at the Northeast end. Let me, I'm like the weatherman trying to figure out. All right. So let's, let's say that I've got the layout in front of me and let's say my head is the center of the church. Okay. Um, up here at the Northeast there's two cameras. One is pointing this way. That's the camera that first caught the perp coming out of the kitchen area and then running his hand down the wall as he walked away from the camera. So that's out of camera, we'll say camera one, pointing this way. So in the northeast corner, pointing west. All right. In that same location, there's another camera and it's pointing down this hallway, okay? It's pointing to the south. 
that camera is the camera that picks up the killer coming out of room 10 with the mystery object and then breaking out the glass of the room across the hall. Okay, so let's call that camera four because we're going to go the way the killer went, which is all the way around counterclockwise. All right, so cameras one and four are here. One, four. Killer comes out of the kitchen right around here and then goes this way. And then there's no cameras up here. All right, no cameras there. That's where Missy was killed. There's no cameras on the wall pointing either direction. Killer on camera goes down here, checks classrooms, gets down to the bottom, the southwest corner. All right. So now there, there we've got two cameras. All right. We've got a camera pointing this way, and that's the one that catches the killer trying to pry into that door that he gives up on. Okay, and then the other camera is going east like this. That's the camera that picks up the killer uh, opening that split door room and being surprised that the whole door doesn't open at once because it's split. Okay, so four cameras. One down here in this corner and then one up here in this corner. Or, you know, one bank of two and then a bank of two down here at the southwest. So there's a lot of gaps. The way those cameras work and the way they shut off once you go out of a certain distance from, from the camera, it shuts, shuts off. So I don't think there's a whole lot of footage interior-wise that, that we don't see. Um, there might be a little bit of the killer after the murder. Okay, because remember, now we're over here, up here at the northwest, all right, kind of at the juncture of the two hallways, the one that goes this way and the one that goes that way. This is where Missy's body is. And so the killer goes here and goes back out the way he came through the kitchen service door. Um, so maybe, maybe as he did that, if he wasn't going too fast, then maybe... This camera over here, golly, this is difficult to do, right? <laughs> All right, so this camera that's pointing this way, maybe as he's leaving, okay, he's killed Missy here, he turns this way, and <laughs> he goes out this door. Um, maybe this camera caught that, but maybe, maybe it wasn't fast enough. You have to think the killer was leaving a lot more quickly than the way he came in. Because when you think about it, he has no idea if Missy was alone. Maybe there was somebody right behind her about to come in. So he can't dilly-dally. He's got to get out of there. <sighs> okay, here's a question. And then let me just ask Dr. Tuttle, because he's a local guy that's familiar with the area. If somebody's passing in front of the church... Um, is it more likely, and they're a pilot, is it more likely that they're coming from or going to DFW or more likely that they are coming from or going to Love Field? Which one of those airports would make more sense? D.R. Tuttle says highways have cameras, going back to our earlier discussion of cameras. Do they really, though? I mean, think about 2016, how rural that area is in Midlothian. And you'd have, to, you'd have to pick up the car and then be able to follow it and jump from one camera to the next camera to know that it's the same vehicle that you're looking at. And it's a silver sedan. It just seems like a hopeless, futile exercise. Do you think this will get solved? If it's a burglary, I think that the odds are stacked against it, Rob. And I, the reason I say that is this. Only 6% of burglaries are ever solved. 6%. That statistic sucks.
Looking forward to the day you can do a video on an arrest in this case. Boy, am I also looking forward to that day. And you know, not only that day, but as soon as the arrest is made, then we get to follow all of that through the trial. If there's a trial, if the person lets it go to trial. And then as soon as it's closed, you know, as soon as there's a conviction and the case is closed, then we can get access to all of the work product that the detectives put into this. You know, everybody they interrogated, um, including including the killer. So I look forward to getting all that and posting that and us discussing it uh, for years to come. Well, we got to get an arrest first. Where on the body do you think the suspect had the firearm on their body? That's a good question, M3. Um, again, that video is so bad. It's so dark and grainy that I have a hard time answering that question. I don't know if there was a place on the vest where it could have been. Um, I don't know if the person could have had a holster and had it in a holster, or I don't know if it, it could have been stuffed down into a pocket. Um, I just can't tell enough detail with that video. It's just really unfortunate that the video doesn't show us more than it does. When do you think the northeast door was broken? Good question. Okay, so let's let's talk a bit about the damage that we do know was done. And now I'm going to do my very uh, non-slick layout stuff, okay, <laughs> where I'm like the center of the church, but up here is the north side of the church. And this is where all the action happened, okay? Um, so in the center of that northern wall is where that kitchen service door was, pretty much the center, roughly. Um, we know that the killer entered into the kitchen through there. That door, the glass was broken out. They, all they had to do was reach in and open it. And they weren't seen on video until they came out of the room that they entered the kitchen and uh, cafe area, room seven, room eight. Um, once they came out, that's when they're first seen on video. If they had broken in over here, now this is the northeast entrance that you're talking about. You walk up some steps because there's a, the, uh, the level of, of that ground slopes down to the woods. And so the church is actually set up higher and back. And so there's steps that go up to the northeast entrance. So there's two doors and you go in there and there's a little area in the, in, in the center. And then you go in the interior doors. So two sets of double doors with glass. That exterior set of doors was broken. The interior set of doors was not. Probably not a reason to break the interior doors, right? Because they're probably not locked. Only the exterior doors were locked. So we know there's that damage, okay? And then around here, there's the damage to the kitchen service door. And then there's some windows that were like screen windows where the screens were like bent or pried, uh, but they're up off the ground. And so there was no evidence that the person actually entered through the windows. So that was it as far as the damage over there on that side. The kitchen door, which we know they entered. The windows, which we don't think they did anything but kind of pry and twist. Um, and then the northeast exterior doors. What I think happened is that they decided that they wanted to test for an alarm. And I think that, I don't really know. I don't really know the order in which they did things. They could have broken out the glass of the kitchen service door and then pried the windows and then gone around to that entrance. Uh, I think that whatever they did, they just kind of did 
one after the other to make sure that they covered all their bases. Okay. Because if you're going to test for an alarm response, you want to make sure that you've done what would trigger an alarm response. So maybe they're thinking, okay, we're going to pry open these windows. Well, what if there's not a sensor on the windows? Okay. Well, let's go to this northeast entrance. We've got these, you know, this big big doors here that are metal doors that have glass in them. Now let's just break the, the heck out of that and uh, and maybe that'll be enough. Um, and maybe they didn't even break into the kitchen service door at this time. Maybe they did those two things. Maybe they did the windows. Maybe they did the northeast entrance. And maybe they took off and came back later. And maybe that was when they entered through the kitchen service door. That would make sense to me. Um, Because maybe they were afraid that all that glass at the northeast entrance, that they might accidentally cut themselves, maybe. And so they they broke it out, but then they didn't want to actually go through it. Yeah, these are just some, some things I think about. I like to speculate a lot. There's things I know. There's things I think and have a pretty good idea of. And there's things that I just totally make up and speculate about. And I, I try to tell people which of those things it is. I try not to tell somebody that something happened for sure if all it is is just speculation. Any toll booths on that road with video cameras? That's a good question for Dr. Tuttle or anybody else who's in here who uh, who is a local, very familiar with that area. Are there toll booths off of 287? And do they have video cameras? Do you think the south pointing camera that caught the intruder leaving the high school room was always pointed that way, or did someone cause it to be pointed so much towards the wall? Hmm. Good question. I mean, there's no way to know. Uh, they had had that security system for 10 years. Uh, the church was built in 2006, so the murder was in 2016. Ten years is a, is a long time. Um, you know, it could have even gotten jostled. Uh, yeah, or maybe a, maybe a screw that kept it stationary got a little loose to where it just moved a little bit. I don't know. Okay, Edith the after says, the statistic is misleading, though, because a murder is attached to it. Murders are solved with more frequency because there's normally more evidence and will from police to solve it. Good point, good point. So, so what you're saying is uh, maybe 6% of all burglaries um, are solved, but what is the percentage of burglaries in which a murder was committed. Maybe it's a higher percentage that are solved. Um, and, and I haven't seen any statistics other than the overall one. So you could have a point there. And I, I get the logic that um, if, if a murder happens, you think the police are going to throw more resources at it. Okay. So Dr. Tuttle is answering my question about um, which airport between Love Field and DFW would this person likely, uh, the person that saw the small dark SUV, which one would they have been going to or coming from? It depends where you live in Midlothian. 67 or 35, you can hit 20 to go towards DFW, or you can take 67 or 35 to Love Field. That's the thing about that area is you've got so many highways going north, south, east, west uh, in the DFW Metroplex that a person can commit a crime, hop on the highway, and they can be many miles away within an hour. What else we got, guys? It takes a special person to desecrate a church. Yep. Um, I read an interesting article, I think it was 
think it was around 2012. So it's about 10 years old now. But it talked about church burglaries being on the rise. And it, it talked about some reasons why that is. One of the reasons is because, um, I guess you would call it the secularization of society. Fewer people go to church. And so fewer people have that mystique around church, um, that it's a holy special place. Um, so there's that stigma being gone, the likelihood that it could be a target for for somebody to break into and commit a crime is, is going to be greater because to them, to a lot of people, it's just like any other building. It's not a sacred or, or holy space. Sadly for me, you know, as a person of faith, I, I find that sad. But um, the other thing, and, and this goes to economics, you know, it used to be that pretty much any business was primarily a cash-based business. And you could go into any business and hold them up at gunpoint or, you know, or burglarize it after hours and get access to cash. That has changed. We are now more of a cashless society. And so your average retail store, very little cash because everybody's using credit cards. Uh, where they're using Apple Pay or whatever. Um, churches themselves have even gone more toward cashless. Um, but here's the thing. Churches are still more inclined to have cash than a lot of other places. There's still something satisfying to churchgoers sitting there in the, in the pew on Sunday morning and an offering plate gets passed. And some churches don't even do that anymore. They just have a box in the back or whatever as you go out. But, you know, taking that money, um, people don't really write checks anymore so much, but um, but you might have a little cash. Um, and if you forgot to give online like you normally do, you still might, you know, put some cash in the, in the plate or in the box. And, you know, we're not talking about burglars having to be um, – high tier burglars. They don't have to be someone looking for a heist. A burglar, by and large, is someone who's kind of in desperate times and they're just trying to survive. I'm not trying to be sympathetic toward burglars. I'm just trying to talk about motive here from some of the things that I've read and investigated. Um, they're looking to get from, from today to tomorrow and survive. Uh, you know, maybe... Maybe it's a drug habit and they're starting to go through withdrawal and they're desperate to get enough cash to go buy some more drugs. Um, or maybe it's not drug related, but um, maybe they're facing eviction and they're, they're trying to, to get some money together for rent. You know, maybe, uh, maybe their girlfriend just had a baby and they're out of diapers and uh, they're just kind of at their wits end about how to survive. Again, not trying to be sympathetic, you know, because there's no good reason to break into a church and steal cash. There, there's no good reason to steal from somebody else to steal something that doesn't belong to you. But there are reasons. And so if you break into a church you're and, and cash is your number one thing that you're trying to get, okay? Bur cash is always number one on a burglar's wish list. A church can be inviting and you could run the risk that, you know, maybe, maybe there's going to be cash there. You can't know. You can't know unless you go to that church and you're one of the insiders. You can't know whether they keep it on site, but you take that chance and you break in just to see. That could be what this killer is. And even though there's not as much cash collected at churches now as there was in the past, maybe $200 is as good as $2,000 to this burglar. Yeah, I use, you know, sometimes I say they just to be neutral, and sometimes I say him, but him's not as neutral as they. But I don't mean they in the plural sense. When I say they, I'm just trying to be neutral.
Okay, DR Tuttle says that there are no toll booths on 287. So no cameras to whoever was asking about that earlier. No cameras because no toll booths. <laughs> Anything outside a high school classroom could be jostled. That makes sense. Maybe even vibration from inside the classroom. You know, if they get a little rowdy in there, as uh, youth groups sometimes do. I was in a youth group at a church when I was a teenager, and we had a band, you know, and uh, it wasn't it wasn't a Christian song, but kind of the theme that they always played every week, because this was around the time of Rocky, and Rocky IV. Um, I have the tiger. They played that song every week. I mean, electric guitars and everything, and so it doesn't take much for a little vibration to, you know, to cause something that's mounted up on a wall to shift a little bit. So that is a good point. Beaver's family thought there may have been a suspect that had a vendetta against a church of Christ. Yeah. Um, that seems a little out there, though, don't you think? I mean, I mean, who has that much hate against a church? You know, to me, if you really had hatred toward a church, then you'd go on a Sunday morning when people are there. Uh, you'd do like what that guy did at uh, at that bank the other day that killed five people. There was something about the place where he worked. He wasn't going to break in there when it was empty. He was going to break in there when there were people there. Um, same thing with a with that school shooting that happened recently, that person that was uh, transitioning uh, gender, uh, wherever, wherever that happened. Um, it was a school that they had attended, you know, years and years ago. Well, they had something against it. That's where they picked. They didn't go after hours. They went when class was in session, right? So I just have a hard time seeing that somebody having a vendetta against the Church of Christ would break into it when no one is there and then kill someone who doesn't even go to that church. Have the police consulted criminal profilers? They have consulted with numerous agencies, including the FBI. You would assume that the FBI has produced for them a criminal profile of this killer. Now, how accurate that is, given the little bit of surveillance video footage that we have, unless there's evidence that we don't know about, I don't know, you know how detailed they can get with that profile. Um, but they're looking at things like the fact that it was a church, the type of mourning that it was. Um, they're looking at a lot of factors, but I just don't know whether they were able to fine tune that profile, but you got to figure they have one. And we're not going to know what that profile says until, until this is solved. Uh, but they've also talked to Texas Rangers. They've, they have brought in people, retired police chiefs and retired federal agents, people who have had experience with murder cases. They've brought them in and opened up the case file for people to take a fresh look and see what they see. So. Mountain Man says, I heard police think it's targeted because of the way she was murdered. If burglary interrupted, would they do extra damage to her? Yeah, see, I think that this is a, um, a much discussed but not proven rumor about the crime scene. Um, everybody thought because of the wording of search warrants in the very beginning that Missy was bludgeoned to death. Um, and it only became common knowledge later on that she was shot. And that's because the first search warrant said puncture wounds to the head and chest. That was, that was literally the search warrant that was produced the day of the murder, before the autopsy had even happened. 
The next day, the next search warrant post-autopsy said um, let me think. Actually, the very first warrant only said deceased from a head wound. Okay. Then after the, the autopsy, the next one said puncture wounds to the head and chest. And then subsequent warrants after that, and there haven't been many, but the ones after that, they just stopped talking about her injuries at all. Um, but yeah, there's there was all the Facebook group whisperings and everything about her being bludgeoned and some some stuff that was pretty ridiculous. Um, if if she was only shot, does that make you think uh, that she was targeted more so than if she was bludgeoned? I mean, to me, neither one of those rules out one way or the other. Um, a person in a panic could bludgeon somebody um, just because they're they're really hyped up and uh, and they just kind of overdo it. It doesn't take long. I mean, you got a hammer in your hand. If you wanted to bludgeon somebody with that hammer, um, it's going to happen very quickly and without much effort. But she was shot. Um, and to me, a gunshot could indicate that it's less personal. But not knowing exactly how the encounter happened, it's really, really hard to say. But don't believe everything that you hear or read on Facebook about the damage done to Missy, because most of it is completely uncorroborated. MPD did turn down the help of the Texas Rangers, and, and it wasn't a problem with the Texas Rangers as an organization. Chief Smith kind of had a problem with one particular Texas Ranger. Um, the Texas Rangers kind of think a lot of themselves. You know, they just do. And uh, I think from what I heard, Chief Smith felt like they were too big for their britches as we might say here in Texas, um, trying to take control of the investigation. Um, and he told them to get out. I mean, he literally told them to leave. And they did. So, but it was more of a personal conflict from what I heard between Chief Smith and one particular Texas Ranger. And I think that's unfortunate because what value could they have brought if, if they had not been kicked out? We don't know. So Nino Scardaletti is here from Cleveland. Home of the house from a Christmas story. See, I know a little bit about Cleveland. If she didn't know the person, why kill her? Because maybe she didn't intend to kill her. Maybe the gun went off. Maybe the person just really doesn't care. Maybe they had an opportunity to kill somebody and they thought, well, why not? Let's see what this feels like. That's evil, but there are evil people in the world. Yeah, that school shooting I was talking about was in Nashville. I couldn't remember where it was. Sadly, there's so many of them now, it's hard to keep them straight. Why won't police announce the profile? Well, here's a problem. From an investigative standpoint, before you've identified somebody, before you've made an arrest, if you publicize a profile and then it turns out to be wrong, and you do catch the real killer, but that killer is nothing like the profile, then that becomes a defense tactic. The defense can say, well, you were sure that it was somebody who's five foot 11 and male and, uh, you know, a loser that, that lived in their mother's basement. And it turned out that it was a woman and she was five, six and she was a successful business owner, blah, blah, blah. You know, um, 
you don't want to damage a case by pigeonholing yourself, by painting yourself into a corner. So that's why police would not announce a profile ahead of time. Yes, beekeeping lady, they did collect DNA, uh, a partial mixed sample. That's all we know. Okay, and, and here's a question about the crime scene that I think leads us to an, another interesting point. Do you think the police at least collected all the stuff in all the trash cans to look for evidence? If the killer wiped off water and threw away a paper towel, the paper towel might have DNA. Um, I would think surely that they did some of that. You know, how detailed they got. You know, did they take plumbing apart to see if there was residue in a drain? You know, I, I don't know. I don't know what they did or to what extent. But what bothers me is they cleared that scene at noon on Tuesday after getting the 911 call at 5. Okay, so in six hours or seven hours, they cleared that scene and turned it back over to the church. That is record time. I, I read something from a detective who was a homicide detective for 25 years, and he said that in all the years of investigating homicides, the longest that it had ever taken to clear one of his crime scenes was 25 hours. And the shortest in 25 years that it had ever taken to clear a murder scene was seven hours. So by that detective's experience, what happened at Creekside with turning it over within seven hours tied a record if he was the detective on this case. I just, I don't understand why they turned it over so quickly. And maybe they have their reasons and we just don't know. But maybe it had to do with it being a church. They Maybe they felt bad. They wanted the church to try to get back to as normal activity as possible. Um, but man, I just, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how you can spend seven hours and be completely thorough. Little insider info from DR Tuttle. The person who cleaned up the murder scene publicly posted that it was the worst scene he had ever cleaned up. Yep. So, to our understanding, and I've talked to DR Tuttle about this, um, there's an individual who runs a cleaning company. Um, and that cleaning company, I guess, specializes in cleanups of crime scenes, um, and not always crime scenes. I'm, sadly, a lot of people commit suicide. Somebody's got to clean up suicides as well. Um, this person was contacted and ended up being contracted out by, uh, I guess, the church. Um, that's the thing, you know. Um, police don't clean up crime scenes. And this was a big thing in the Alex Murdoch case in South Carolina that uh, one of his brothers made a big deal about the fact that there were still some skull fragments um, after the murder. Um, and he, he was going in trying to clean that stuff up. And that's horrible. As a family member, you don't ever want to do that. And a lot of people were like, well, that's horrible that it was there and the police didn't clean it up. Police don't do that. They gather the evidence that they can, but there's other things. There's tissue, there's blood. They don't clean that up. Unfortunately, the property owner, after something like that happens, um, has to get it cleaned up. And in a lot of states, in a lot of states, there, there is crime victim funds that are available. You apply for them, you get the money, you can use that for things like crime scene cleanup. Somebody with a connection to a loved one should never be in a position to do that. You should get a crime scene company that specializes in doing it 
who are third parties, don't have a personal investment, the emotion and all that, and let them do it. Good question. How long had this guy been cleaning up scenes? Did he mean the worst in terms of debris or did he just mean an emotional impact? Yeah, DR Tuttle, did you get a sense what he meant when he said worst? Hmm. Um. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I guess, I mean, I guess that's a good point. But, I mean, how much do those fragments actually show you as evidence that you don't already know? Um, I guess one way to look at it is that they felt like they knew that it was a shotgun blast from you know, from all the damage that was done in the Murdoch case, um, the brain became dislodged and was actually on the ground. Um, so collecting every single piece of skull, I don't, I, apparently they felt like that just wasn't necessary. For right or for wrong. So a Texas Ranger said that MPD asked them to answer phones instead of using their resources. What? Well, if true, that's shocking. I mean, really, really. That's like if you had... If you had access to, you know, the SEAL Team 6 team that took out Osama bin Laden, you have access to them in, in an operation, but you want them to answer the phone and take and, you know, accept tips from the public rather than <laughs> go in and do what they've been trained to do. <sighs> okay, what else? What is the most probable way that this case can be solved? I, I still have to believe that that DNA evidence they collected, if there's enough markers in there, I think that as DNA technology progresses, I think that that DNA is the best chance we have of getting this case solved. I hope they're not lying about having the DNA. I hope that it was usable and that it really is from the killer. And um, yeah, you know, somebody mentioned earlier, we didn't really talk about it, but familial DNA. Texas is one of, I think, nine states that allows for police to use familial DNA. So they can go to Ancestry.com or 23andMe, uh, some of these other um, heritage DNA, I think is one that I've used before, um, and, and try to try to figure out, um, you know, somebody that is related to the killer. And then from there, find out who the killer is. The kind of thing that Paragon Labs does. Um, I just I think that's that's the best chance of this case being solved, because I think that if the killer was going to talk to somebody who would then come to police, I think that would have happened by now. Oh, well, guys, it's uh, we're getting close to three hours here. So let's go 15 more minutes. If you've got a question, 
um, I'll be glad to answer it. Or uh, if I can't answer it, if it's just a point for discussion, then we'll discuss it. Thanks again, everybody, for being here. Um, it's been a long time since I did the video. Um, I put in a lot of hours at work, so it's hard to find time. But today, I felt like that was something we needed to do. Seven-year mark. If you followed this case since the beginning, in your wildest dreams, wildest imagination, did you think that it would go to seven years and then still be unsolved? Completely unsolved to the point of almost being a cold case. You know, not even having hot leads, you know, that the public could say, well, I think that guy did it. I mean, it's like nothing. Rob S. says, what do you think of Tom Webster's research on the case? I actually worked with Tom Webster on that a little bit. He, um, he and I talked and exchanged a lot of emails, and he had a lot of questions. And uh, anything that I could answer or give him background on, I did. Um, he definitely, by far, has put the most comprehensive video together. Um, I, mean, I mean, he put something like 500 hours, 600 hours of research into this and putting the video together. So um, tremendous effort. Um, you know, he doesn't identify a killer. I, I still don't know that he necessarily has given enough thought into burglary and to untargeted theory in general, but uh, but he did a lot of pulling together of research. You know, if you're into numbers, numerology, or if you're into um, the Bible, Seven is a significant number. It's a number of completion. So it's my prayer that the seventh year of Missy's murder is going to be a year of completion where we get to a point where an arrest is made. I have said that every year, though. It's really frustrating. Yeah, Sonino, John Lorden is a great guy, and he he's done so much for uh, true crime, um, and he's he's been the nicest of people to me. Um, I think a lot of him, and uh, yeah, from time to time he he does need to revisit the Missy Beavers case. I guess the last time was at the two year mark when I was a guest on his show on Brain Scratch. Um, but the thing about revisiting it is there's not a whole lot new to talk about. So uh, that's kind of the thing. I don't think the FBI is working on it right now. Um, I think they were brought in early on for case management and, uh, you know, they have specialized software that kind of allows you to organize all the all the tips that are coming in and that sort of thing. Um, so um, I think that I think that was a lot of their involvement. Um, let's see what else. The family deserves that this case be solved. You're absolutely right. Those girls will never have a mom to walk to. Well, it's a dad that walks you down the aisle, but you know what I mean. Girls want their mom to be at their wedding um, to share in that moment. And Missy will never get that. And her girls will, will never be able to get that. So... Has anything really new come up in recent years? Well, I mean, I've 
I've uncovered some things myself from my sources in recent years. Um, I, I discovered what the source of the glass was around Missy's body. It was a display case. What they did at the church was um, for the little kids, they would have them memorize Bible verses. And then the display case had these little toys in it with different values on them, I guess. Kind of like when you go in a Chuck E. Cheese's or, you know, one of those arcade places where you can turn in tickets and, and get a prize. Um, they would have prizes in this glass display case for the kids. They'd come up and, and recite a, a Bible verse that they memorized, then they could get a prize or collect points toward a prize. So that, well, that was what the source of the glass was. So um, from talking to my sources, you know, I believe 100% that that's what that was. Uh, another thing is the mystery object that the person was carrying when they were hammering out the glass of room nine at the end of the video. Uh, it's the end of the video as the police released it in that sequence. Um, I know what that object was. As we said earlier, it's a plastic storage bin. It had some small tools in it like sockets. Um, I know that 100%. That's what that was. Uh, what else do we know? The fact that the most disturbed room was a room that had filing cabinets in it that was in the office area. I actually know the specific room number, but don't want to get too detailed because some things are probably better left, you know, not revealed um, as things that only the killer would know. But uh, but that whole thing about the filing cabinets thing, that was new. Um, another fairly new thing that I discovered is the camera that's on the outside wall, kind of pointing toward the driveway, that was the one that was malfunctioning. I learned that it was known to the church. It had a little glitch, and you'd have to climb up on a ladder and hit a reset button. And nobody had bothered to do that for about two weeks. So they knew that that camera was offline, and uh, that, was, that was the camera that police kind of were referring to when they talked about uh, a technical glitch or a malfunction. Um, so those are, those are some of the things that were new over the past couple of years. Do you think the guy's living close by? Um, I doubt it. Kind of a crude saying, I'll clean it up a little, but you don't poop where you eat. Um, bottom line, someone who's going to break into a church, um, it's probably not somebody who's going to be living close by because you're, I mean, you're just asking for it, right? Does North Prong Creek have a rock creek bed or a mud creek bed? That might be a question for D.R. Tuttle. Do you know that? I know that when I look at the bed, it's very white. Um, that Does that indicate that it's more of a of a rock creek bed as opposed to a mud creek bed because from the aerial views it's just it's very white to me Let's see what dr tuttle says about that i have not visited her grave um the rare times i've been to midlothian i've either been passing through or i stopped very briefly just didn't didn't have time to to go visit her grave. I'm not. I'm not big into graves. Um, in my belief, the, the person and their essence is not who's there. So, uh, I realize people look for something tangible, and, and I don't want to disrespect that. But just for me, um, you know. It's like going on knocking a door on a door when uh, the person has moved. Would the church let someone come into the church and take pictures and maybe do some walkthrough? Yeah, that's like not only no, but heck no. Um, the church is very protective. You are not going to get permission to go in and do anything. So I will just leave that at that.
this is an interesting thing we haven't touched on. Yeah, that was another new thing that we discovered in the last couple of years, as Dr. Tuttle points out. You know, it was always kind of a mystery why the person, the first person that got to the church, couldn't actually get into the church. You know, he doesn't wait in his car. Um, he goes and thinks that it's locked. He's under the awning. He's trying to get in, and he can't get in. Um, and the thing is, Missy had unlocked the door with a key, but then above the keyhole on the door is a little thumb turn, a little latch thing that kind of goes from left to right or whatever, from one position to the other. If you've unlocked the door with the key, you still have to turn that thumb turn, kind of like a deadbolt thumb turn, and then you can open the door. If you just don't, if you just leave that thumb turn alone, it doesn't matter that she's unlocked it with the key, it's still not going to open for you if you just pull on the handle. This first camper was there for an early bird workout at 4.30. Some say 4.35. He was there either at 4.30 or 4.35. And he didn't, it was his first time, and he didn't know how that thumb turn worked. So he waited around um, until other campers got there later on, and it was 5 o'clock before somebody who actually knew how it worked tried it, and they were able to go in. Okay, on the question about the, the creek bed at North Prong Creek, D.R. Tuttle says, I think in the curves it gets to the white rock. And then he says, we have white rock everywhere around here. Oh, yeah, and this is one thing we know. The church is kind of in the midst of remodeling or planning to remodel. I'm not sure how far along they are. Further out we get from the murder, the more, the more things are going to change. And so when we look back and investigate and think about uh, the way things were in 2016, we really have to think about what's changed and what hasn't and the way things existed back then. Okay, two more minutes. Still got 38 people in here, which is more people we had than we had two hours ago. So thanks everybody for joining us. Like I said, I will, as I have time, I'll take some interesting links and put them in the description. So come back here to this video um, after the fact and look in the description. I'll try to post a picture of that mystery object as it really is, which is a white storage bin, plastic storage bin from Walmart. Um, and, uh, you know, other things of interest as I look through my catalog of stuff that I've found in the past couple of years. Okay, DR Tuttle. This is one of the things we uncovered in the past few years. The inside of the tiles in the foyer is 30 inches. Yep. So, so you've got a square, so the square of tile, but then there's a border around that that's six inches wide. So the inner tile is 30 inches across both directions. So it's a square. So 30 inches across, 30 inches up and down, but then the border around it adds another six inches. So you're looking at three feet square, right? We talk about square, yep. All directions, it's 36 inches, yeah. So 36 square inches, three feet. Um, and yeah, I think if somebody really analyzed the video, I mean, angles can be tricky and everything, but if you can get it to just the right point to see how much of the shoe uh, encompasses the inside of that 30-inch tile, then you might be able to maybe see what the shoe size is. I know some people have speculated that the shoes are really, really big, they're like size 13 or something, um, but I just don't know 
you know, if anybody's actually confirmed it. I'm going to ask you a weird question, VTPSTTU. Um, there was a guy that I got into a bit of a tiff with on Reddit who I believe had an engineering background. I wonder if that was you. <laughs> I mean, you and I have gotten along just fine in here. So, uh, but yeah, me and that guy didn't didn't get along too well. But I remember him saying that he had a background as an engineer. Oh, okay. So 36 square inches is 6 inches by 6 inches. So, yeah. Math is not my strong suit. I majored in journalism, okay? <laughs> One thousand two hundred and ninety six square inches. Yeah, see, that makes it seem huge. <laughs> you never done read it. OK, well. OK, fair enough. I was just wondering. But it makes sense. There's plenty of engineers that are into true crime, you know, because you're logical thinkers, right? You, you know, you try to figure out the answer to a problem. My father-in-law is, he doesn't have an engineering degree, but he has an engineering mind, if that makes sense. And he loves to take a problem and figure out a solution to the problem. And if he has to build something that didn't exist before in order to solve the problem, he'll do that. All right. A little after 10. Um, and I guess this is as good a point as any, for us to wrap it up. Again, c come back once uh, once the video is on YouTube, and uh, I'll update the description and put some interesting things up there as follow-up. And, um, you know, you can also enter comments uh, in the comments to that video later on. And uh, if you think of a question you have for me, I'll, I'll catch it later and, and answer it. Um, and again, just glad that everybody joined us tonight. It was fun to do this. It was really fun to do this. And uh, maybe another year won't go by <laughs> with, uh, without me putting something else out there. Anyway, thank you all, and uh, have a good night. And uh, again, keep Missy in your thoughts, and if you pray, keep her in your prayers her family, and your prayers. All right? Be well. Stay safe.